Hey everybody, Jeremy Blum here, back with another episode of Tech Bits. I know it's been a while since I've done the last episode, but I've had a couple of videos in the meanwhile, and I hope those have kept you entertained uh, while I'm gearing up to do some more episodes of Tech Bits. Right now, I'm in New Hampshire for the summer, so I'm staying in a dorm for the New Hampshire Institute of Art, but I'm working or interning at an engineering company in Manchester doing some robotics work and stuff, so that's pretty cool, that's what I'm doing this summer. I'm gearing up for two computer builds towards the end of the summer. Uh, first off, I'm rebuilding my computer, uh, which goes by the codename Phoenix. It was Ultimate Computer 5, I believe. Uh, I'm rebuilding that with an i7 and all that stuff. I'm waiting for the next uh, hex core i7 to come out that's not the Extreme Edition because I don't want to pay $1,000 for my CPU. Um, so I got that coming up, and then I'm also going to be building a media computer center for my the apartment that I'll be living in next year uh, at college so that we can watch movies and stuff. So today I'm going to be talking about something that applies not only to computers but all electronics, things you use every day from cell phones all the way up to government spy satellites. Uh, and that's the difference between analog and digital signals. Uh, a lot of people hear the word, word digital and stuff, and they're like, oh, digital revolution, everything's digital now, it used to be analog, now it's digital. That's not really the whole picture. Uh, analog is still very much present in our lives, and it's unavoidable. The world around us is entirely analog, and the systems we make are often digital, but we need to create a way to interface between the two of those. So I'm going to explain kind of uh, what each one is, how we convert between the two and what it means for your computers uh, and your electronics and your cell phones and all that stuff. And today I'm going to do tech bits a little bit differently. I'm going to draw some pictures for you guys to help show what I'm talking about. All right, so let's uh, start talking about what analog is. So an analog signal is a signal that can have a huge range of values. Uh, but before we can understand exactly what that range is, we need to talk about what logic levels are. A logic level is the voltage level at which a particular device communicates. So if we're talking about a lot of common microcontrollers that are in use today, a common logic level is 5 volts. Uh, some of the newer ones use 3.3 volts and 1.8 volts, which help reduce their power draw, but it doesn't really matter. So let's say that we have a microcontroller, and it has a base voltage of 0, or ground, and a maximum voltage of 5 volts, like that. An analog signal can vary anywhere between these two rails, like a sine wave, for example. So at each point on this signal, if we t sample it over time, each of these points is going to represent a different voltage value. And each of those values is your analog value for the signal. Most things that we deal with in the real world are analog, and there's really no avoiding that. For example, let's consider a light sensor. If you have a light sensor here, and we have the sun, very happy shining on the light sensor, the light sensor is going to basically act as a variable resistor. So a resistor is something that resists the flow of current. Um, so if we have 5 volts here going through our variable resistor, which is denoted by the resistor symbol with an arrow through it for variability, the sunlight that shines on our variable resistor is going to change that resistance and therefore change the amount of current that's allowed to pass through. As a result of that, the voltage drop over the resistor is going to change and we'll get a different voltage out on the other end. So you can use this for interfacing into a microcontroller uh, and basically what happens is as the brightness increases or decreases, that resistor value is going to change and your voltage is going to change simultaneously. So for example, if we're increasing the brightness slowly, you might start with an input at zero and it'll slowly ramp its way all the way up to five volts and over time here you're going to get a change in voltage which is our analog signal. Now let's talk about digital signals. Digital signals are a little bit different. They either have one of two values, on or off. The way we often see this represented is with a one or zero. One representing high or on, zero representing low or off. When high or low, when I say that, I'm talking about the logic levels that a microprocessor, a computer, or some kind of chip is interpreting. So if we're talking about the same 5-volt microprocessor that we were talking about before, what we'll see is, is when we get a 5-volt signal, that's our 1. And when we get a 0-volt signal, that's our 0. 
So, but what happens if we get some value that's in between there going into a digital pin that's expecting a digital value? Well, the way it works is we basically have some kind of threshold. So, if we're looking at some kind of values that range from 0 to 5 volts, the way it's going to work is there's going to be this, this kind of dead area in the middle uh, where the value is essentially floating. But if we get any voltage between, let's say, 0 and 2 volts, it'll be represented as a logic 0 or a binary 0. If we get between 3 and 5 volts, it'll be interpreted as a 1 or a logic high. So that's the way digital signals work, it's either on or off. Um, an example of this in real life is just a simple light switch. So if we have um, our light bulb over here, I'm sorry, I'm a terrible artist. This is the representation of our light switch here. Uh, when we close the switch, electricity is going to flow through and turn the light bulb on, which is, of course, connected to the ground on the other end. Um, and that's basically going to, if this is a microprocessor here, instead of a light bulb, it'll register 1 because you're getting the full voltage here. Uh, if it's open, then it's going to register a 0. In your computer, all your communications are done digitally. So that means they're sending lots of binary bits or binary values between components. Sometimes this is done in serial uh, with a whole bunch of ones and zeros being sent down the line um, one after the other. So every certain time period, a value comes through and it's either a zero or one, and that's interpreted by the other end to be a certain value. Uh, or in some cases, it's done in parallel. So you might have let's say four parallel bits that can go through simultaneously and they're received by four sensors or four receivers on the other side, anything like that. So the obvious disadvantage of parallel is you have to have a sender and a receiver uh, pin or I.O. or something like that uh, for both the sending and receiving end. Whereas with serial data, you have to s wait to send each part of the information, but you only need to use one line to send it. Now that you know the difference between analog and digital sensors, you might be thinking why we, or wondering why we even use digital. Analog allows us to portray a whole range of various values uh, from ground to whatever the logic level is, whereas digital is just on or off. The answer to this is actually pretty simple. Uh, basically, uh, in the environment and in general, a lot of noise is introduced into analog signals, and that's pretty much unavoidable. Even 60 hertz electrical lines that run through your home produce a ton of interference on many electrical devices that then has to be filtered out. If you're using a digital logic signal, however, though, remember I talked about that threshold before. So it's either you're above or below that threshold. There's not really any other thing to think about there. So even if there's noise in the signal, it's bouncing up and down a bit. If it's above 3 volts, depending on the logic, if it's a 5 volt logic level, then it's going to be interpreted as a logic 1, which is what it should be, even if there's some bouncing around on there from interference from other sources. So digital signals allow us to eliminate that completely. Um, we don't have to do as much processing, which saves money on the electronics. Uh, and it also means that we can deal with the data faster because we don't ha have to use high and low pass and band pass filters and all that stuff to get rid of noise that we don't want. Uh, the data comes right in, we have the information we need, and we're ready to process it. Basically, what we have to do is a little bit of um, error checking to make sure what we sent on one end came through on the other side. So as a result of this, digital electronics basically become way cheaper to produce, and that's why your computer is a digital device. It's not processing a ton of analog signals. The CPU is entirely ones and zeros, uh, on or off, and it sends a whole slew of those out, a lot of digital bits, and that's what's used to do the processing inside your computer or your cell phone or a government spy satellite. But that introduces an obvious question. If the environment is naturally analog, everything that we see and do is analog, nothing's really just on or off, how do we convert between the two? How do we take analog inputs into our systems and convert them into digital? So that's done with analog digital converters. Um, and let me show you how those work. Let's say we have an analog signal coming into our system from a light sensor or a flex sensor, a force sensor, or something like that, basically anything. Um, we're going to get some value that maybe varies up and down a little bit like this. Maybe the light got brighter and then dimmer again and it, so gradually. And we have an analog signal that looks like this, which goes from 0 to 5 volts again. 
So now we need to convert that to a digital signal because that's what we need in order to process it. What our digital signal looks like is going to be dependent upon the resolution of our analog digital converter. And I won't go into how analog digital converters work. There's several different types and approaches to doing this. Uh, they're all fairly complicated. Uh, some of them have better resolution but worse timing and things like that. But I'll just explain basically how it works. Essentially what you do is you have some kind of resolution in terms of number of bits. So if we have a 10-bit analog digital converter, that's going to be 2 raised to the 10th power bits because 2 is binary. It's 0 or 1, so there's two options. Raised to the 10th power. And that equals 1,024. So a 10-bit system is going to have 1,024 different points of resolution. Uh, generally, we do 0 to 1,000 and 23 in the analog digital converter because we need to account for zero volts which would register as a zero. So what happens here is this is then broken down into essentially 10 divisions uh, from zero to five volts and this signal is digitized basically like this. So my drawing there isn't perfect, but essentially what's happening is we're breaking up that signal into even logic level voltages. Um, and so the number of breaks or horizontal lines that we have in here is going to be determined by the resolution of our analog digital converter. Uh, so that's dependent upon the hardware you're using or the microcontroller or the system in your computer. So if we have a 10-bit resolution, we can get 10 different steps from 0 volts up to 5 volts. I don't really have that displayed here because there's not enough room, but you get the idea. So in a lower resolution uh, system, let's say there's only one bit of resolution, what it'll look like is essentially something more like this. If we only have one bit of resolution, that means it's either a 0 or a 1. So it's only going to go up to 1 when this thing is at 5 volts. But with 10 bits of resolution, we get a much clearer representation of what the sine wave looks like, essentially digitized. So now, this is a value that we can actually work with. We have some number from 0 to 1,023, and once we have a number, we can do whatever we want with it. Now what happens when we want to convert digital to analog? So if we have a computer system, which is entirely digital, and we want to have it change the brightness on a light bulb that we have attached, we need to be outputting some varying voltage level there. But our system isn't generally capable of doing that. You can get a digital to analog converter, but they're expensive, uh, the technology is fairly complicated. So what we generally do when possible is we employ a trick called pulse width modulation, or PWM. And we basically use this to replace the more expensive process of pure digital to analog conversion uh, with something that kind of cheats and gets the same job done. Most devices that we want to act with and give an analog signal are responding relatively in the world of electronics slowly to the signal that they're getting. So let's say we have a motor that we want to run at only half speed. If you want to run a motor at half speed, you give it half of its voltage, assuming it's a regular DC motor. Uh, an example of this are the fans in your computer, which actually do use pulse width modulation from the motherboard. So what we'll do is we can only give it a zero or a five volt signal, because that's all we're capable of outputting, a digital signal. We can't give it some value in between to give it half voltage and make it go at half speed. So what we'll do is we actually modulate the signal up and down with a square wave. And this is called the duty cycle. So basically what happens here is we have it on for half the time and off for half the time. And we modulate this back and forth very, very rapidly. And because motors can't respond instantaneously to changes in voltage, they need time to accelerate and decelerate. What basically happens is the motor averages this signal and you get something that's pretty straight right through the middle there at around two and a half volts and the m motor will run at half of its normal speed, assuming it runs at full speed at five volts. Another example of this is an LED. If you want to change the brightness on an LED, uh, you would do the same thing. You can apply pulse width modulation. But LEDs actually respond very quickly to changes in voltage because they're just a simple diode. So what's actually happening when you pulse width modulate an LED is your eye is doing the averaging. Our eyes aren't fast enough to discern the differences here, which are done on the order of milliseconds. And the light actually blinks on and off 
very rapidly with this signal, but our eye averages it and sees it being dimmer because it's on for about half the time. There you have it, that's your quick crash course in what analog and digital actually mean and how they play a role in things we do every day. Uh, your computer, like I said, that uses pulse width modulation to control the fans, uses different logic levels to communicate with all the components, uh, all that stuff. So it's totally relevant, uh, and if you want to learn more about analog and digital and microcontrollers and pulse width modulation, all that stuff, I recommend getting a microcontroller kit and playing around with it. Uh, I started doing this a couple, I don't know, several years ago now, and I've been messing with this stuff ever since, as you probably know if you've seen a lot of my other videos. And it's a lot of fun. You learn a lot. Uh, you learn about electricity. And it's all very interesting because building a computer is one thing, but learning what's actually going on inside in the circuits opens up a whole new level of understanding, and it's, it's really, really interesting. So if you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, I recommend buying a microcontroller kit like the Arduino is a great one for starting on, or the Parallax Basic Stamp is another great one. Uh, the Arduino supports both analog to digital conversion uh, and pulse width modulation, and so you can start playing with those, and it's a lot of fun. And if you want to see some of the electronics projects that I've done with this kind of stuff, uh, a lot of them are on my blog, jeremyblum.com, and I always post full source code and schematics and stuff if you want to try building some of them on your own. Or you can go check out my other channel, link right here and in the doobly-doo beneath me, and uh, I have some other electronics projects I've done there to maybe give you some ideas to get started on your own. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and subscribe if you want to see more episodes of TechBits. Thanks.